Welcome to the Goddess Deeds Crowd, where we foster confessional integrity, liturgical preservation, and preaching that doesn't stink. We believe that the historic liturgy of the divine service is more than mere cobwebs of antiquity, but it is a true treasure of the Church to be dusted off and brought down from her attic to be enjoyed. So let's get dusting. Welcome back to the Godestine's Crowd. This is Jason Broughton, your host. Today we have with us Sean Denzer, the pastor of Trinity Lutheran Church in Great Bend, North Dakota, as well as Peace Lutheran Church in Barney, North Dakota. A blogger, one of the new ones, perhaps not so new now. Welcome back, Sean. Hey, it's great to be here. It's good to have you. Today we're going to look at, and this is a question that came from one of our listeners, about the proper use of a choir within the Lutheran Divine Service or within a liturgical setting. So I wanted to ask you first, what is the biblical grounding for having music in the liturgy itself? We see in the Old Testament uh, that there are many singers. There's all kinds of music uh, on the occasion of victories, battles that are won, coronations of kings, uh, but especially surrounding the temple and the tabernacle and its worship. Uh, And there's lots of resources to see how integral music is. Uh, In particular, I think for us Christians in the New Testament, I have no better passage than Colossians chapter 3, verse 16 Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The key thing here is to let the word of Christ dwell richly in us. Uh, The way that happens is teaching, admonishing, and singing, making music. Uh, Music not only enriches uh, the words by letting them be proclaimed in an elevated uh, way, in a more dramatic way, a way that takes more of our energy, a way that takes more of our craft, uh, and therefore helps to emphasize these are important things worth listening to and even worth saying and hearing beautifully. Uh, But um, the word of Christ itself is the rich thing, and it's supposed to be richly in us, which means not stingily, not skimpily, not, uh, you know, technically we did it, so we we covered our base and fulfilled that law. But this is what we rejoice in as Christians. You know, we're, we hear it, it. It's the center of our worship. It's, I mean, it's, it's not even the center. It's just all over the place in our worship. And then we leave that place echoing it, singing it, humming it, uh, talking to each other about what we've heard, uh, which absolutely fulfills, you know, what Moses says about letting that word um, be constant and be bound to our foreheads and our door frames and everywhere else. Yeah. When you sing the word of God, it really draws your attention to having to slow down in order to learn it. You actually then have to almost memorize the words so that you can sing them to the music. It has that way of just concentrating your efforts on those words of God. It does. Sometimes people make the comment that they like it better when a pastor in a sermon might read a hymn text or recite it, or they like it better when they as a congregation just read it together. Uh, I don't know if I believe them, frankly. I I think they're right. It it, it takes, it's a lot easier to simply look at the words and focus on them for a moment. But you're right. The, The practice of not just using one side of your brain, but both sides of your brain, uh, singing it, taking the time not just to make sure you said the word accurately, but also even to to sing it on the right pitch. This drives these things deeper into our brains, deeper into our minds, and I would say also deeper into our hearts uh, spiritually, uh, that we actually know these things. We we treasure them. And, And we know this, anybody who's ever been with somebody who's old, who's getting uh, dementia or Alzheimer's, knows that they can pray the Lord's Prayer, probably the last thing, and they probably can sing Jesus Loves Me or some great hymn or the Nunc Dimittis out of the liturgy uh, almost until the day they die. 
that is exactly what I, as a pastor, want. I want everyone to know the Nunc Dimittis and be able to sing that even when they don't know who I am or who their own kids are. Uh, so that's a huge value. And in, in the same way, you can look at it from two ways. From a good works perspective, we as Christians, of course, want to do the best in worship. We want to give God the best. He to say he deserves it is kind of quaint and silly. Uh, uh, that acts as if we're doing something great for him. Uh, but it's worth our time. And music is a way of taking that time and taking that effort to do the best we possibly can in thanksgiving to him. But also, again, the point of Colossians is, is not from us to God as much as it is from him to us. Because his word is so important for us, he wants it to dwell in us in a rich way. Uh, not just in terms of quantity, uh, but also in terms of quality and, and music uh, helps both uh, stay. It, it sticks with us. So it's going to always be with us in, in rich quantity. And it, you, you have to be a stone for music uh, to not be a powerful th force in your life, I think. Yeah. My Sunday school teachers have found that when the children come to recite the parts of their catechism to them, and they come to the primary text for the institution of the supper, that they almost, to every single one of the children, ends up singing the words of institution as they have been sung, as they have heard them sung in church. That's a no-brainer, I think. Yeah, it's a free part of the catechism they get to learn, right? Right. Just because right. they've heard you sing it, and if they're a five-year-old like mine, they sing it along with you. We can allow that, I guess. Uh, you know, it's not a big deal. Uh, but it's a huge deal, right? Because now they know these words. Uh, some people like John 3.16 as the gospel nutshell, I think. I think the words of institution are far clearer. And uh, and thank God, my congregation, my kids know them. They, I can hardly keep them from singing it out loud, and, and I wouldn't want to. Exactly. With that biblical framework on the place of music, either liturgically or just within a liturgical setting, how historically have been have choirs been used within the church in general, and then within Lutheranism specifically? The choir's always been important, as at least as long as we have evidence of music, which is not actually back to the earliest church. That isn't to say they weren't using music, but we just don't have it. Uh, we have very little Greek music before Christ was born either. Uh, but we, you know, if you're a music, a musician or studying music literature, you start with some little things from Greece, from the poets and the playwrights, and you jump pretty quickly to Gregorian chant, which is a large, Ambrosian and Gregorian chant form a large part of Western music uh, for a long time. And, and this is the daily bread of, of church music. And what are they singing? The Bible. Uh, they're singing quotes from the Psalms, especially. Uh, as we get into the Middle Ages, uh, we start getting, the Middle Ages are by no means dark, and the church is the place where you see that, especially in music. We start to get multi-part music. We start to get uh, variations on old chants. We even start to get some congregational singing. Uh, and, and yet what the choir did was always so dissociated in the Middle Ages from what, say, the priest was doing. Hopefully he could sing too because he had his parts. But for a lot of the service, he's just kind of mumbling the prayers, doing everything quietly at the altar while the choir is going on and on with something beautiful. Maybe the organist takes over for a while. And when they ring the bell for the consecration, that's when everybody kind of comes together for a moment and then back to our separate corners. The Reformation, uh, in, a, in a lot of ways, brings liturgy back to the people. It doesn't mean that it takes it away from the choir, that the choir was the enemy of the people, but now the choir is working together with the people. And frankly, the priest, the pastor, is praying and singing uh, in harmony and in concord with what the choir is doing and with what the congregation is doing. It's not a competition or cacophony of different things going on simultaneously, but this is so trite to say it, that everybody's working together. We're actually participating in the same event, the same service. Uh, in addition to teaching the faith, which is exactly what we find in Colossians, that this word is to dwell in us richly for the sake of teaching and admonishing everybody. So 
uh, people have probably heard about Luther's hymns really being a way of singing the catechism, of taking the faith and turning it into like a broadside news sheet in the middle of church. Uh, but, but even what Luther did was not a replacement for or a substitution for the liturgy. It was an enhancement of it. It was giving to the congregation something that's appropriate for them and their level of uh, musicianship. And the choir by no means disappeared. In fact, the boys' schools, wherever there's a big city with a Latin school, the boys continued doing what they were doing. They sang the chant. Uh, the boys, in some cases, at matins and vespers, were in charge of singing the readings uh, uh, as if they were a lector. Uh, and then that was done in a very skilled way uh, that I don't think our, our lay readers necessarily imitate in today. And uh, they continued to sing in Latin. They continued to learn figural music, which means multi-parts. But everything that was done was in concert with the preaching, which, which is revived in the Reformation, and the distribution of the Lord's Supper, which is clarified and focused. Um, so that, in a sense, I don't think it's too much to say that the Lutheran service, uh, shortly after the Reformation, really does have it all. It's got congregational singing that is vibrant. It quickly involves instruments in that as well. The choir is helping and, and assisting, maybe taking uh, extra stanzas of a long hymn with the congregation. All of the beautiful chant uh, between the pastor and the choir uh, is in place. And, uh, and in recent times, uh, especially here in America, we're familiar with the common service, which is uh, uh, old TLH page 15 or in the Lutheran service book setting three. And uh, it has some Anglican chant settings that are, are something that uh, an average parishioner is able to sing along with. I think we have something that even Luther didn't expect was possible, which is that the people could be singing the ordinary of the mass uh, while the choirs are taking the other propers that change every week, and the priest or the pastor that is is uh, singing back and forth with all of them, uh, and uh, and then the hymns are are also adding uh, very memorable and uh, and useful teaching and admonishing one another uh, with this rich word of Christ. Uh, so, so I think uh, Lutherans in particular. We know Luther himself loved music, and we know that our congregations are known for being singing congregations. Uh, but music has made itself something essential. And, and in the Lutheran church, it's not an addition. It's not a fancy uh, extra, but it's actually part and parcel of what's going on in the service. Would it be fair, going back to thinking about the use of the choir in the Middle Ages, and then how it changes just slightly when Lutheranism comes onto the scene. Would it be fair to say that during the Middle Ages, it was a solo, that the choir ran the show almost in every single way? Whereas when we get to the Reformation, the divine service becomes much more like an orchestra in that everyone has their part. And yet it is still focused to a common end. I think that would work. Uh, I mean, our understanding of harmony in today's world is when you have multiple parts singing at the same time, but it doesn't sound bad, right? It actually sounds better because you've got all these parts singing together in a, in a harmonious way. Uh, definitely. I think Luther... It's often been stated that the pulpit and the organ bench or the balcony sing in harmony with each other uh, in Lutheranism. Uh, Bach is a great example, and he's maybe a late uh, benefactor of things that came before him that may have been even more harmonious, in my opinion. But uh, Bach and his pastor, you can see, are working together. The cantatas are evidence of that. The cantata was a poetic, beautiful kind of multimedia, I suppose you could say, uh, it, uh, presentation of the very same teaching that was in the sermon for that day. That is marvelous. And it's not just going on at the same time or in the same building. Uh, so in that way, you could say, yeah, in the Middle Ages, the, the choir was one solo, but there was also the solo of the pastor. His was just unheard, seen maybe. Uh, and then uh, the people, well, who knows what they're doing, but they've got the windows to look at, right? The goal in all of this is the preaching of God's word. And as Luther is well known for saying, that next to theology, music is the highest art, as 
a handmaiden, so to speak. How do we maintain within the, that Lutheran understanding of music being a handmaiden? When does that go awry? When does music no longer serve the word of God, but the divine service and the liturgy is serving what kind of music? A, a true marriage is a we. It's the two are no longer two but one. That's why divorce is such a violent and uh, and abhorrent thing. Uh, if, if we're going to use the language of handmaiden, I think also the language of helpmeet is fitting. And suddenly we see uh, theology and music being very much as a husband and wife. Um, there is an order in this. There is a there is a headship that theology has, uh, and there is a servant submissiveness to music. And yet by no means, as, as we know in Christian marriage, by no means does this turn theology into a tyrant that stifles uh, uh, the wife. Uh, but in fact, uh, both are working together, uh, to use that word again, harmoniously. I think that's a fabulous analogy Luther has, and it fits perfectly. Uh, for lack, of, I think in our discussion, it may be helpful as a result to talk about the cantor or the organist, the musician in the church, as a, as a lady. It'll help it keep clear for our discussion. But uh, by, I'm, a, I'm a musician myself and plan to be one until I got the bug to be a pastor. Uh, so by no means does that mean this is a a womanly thing at all. In fact, I think most of the greatest composers are men. Uh, but but the service, the, this uh, the service of music is a helper. Is is yes, second to theology and second only to theology, as Luther says. Uh, so how does it go awry? The same way a marriage goes awry when you have two people running off doing their own thing together. Uh, sorry, doing their own thing apart, but maybe just in the same room. Uh, I think that's probably probably the simplest way to put it. Yeah, I think you're right. If you will, maybe we should talk about then kind of more brass tacks. What should the relationship between the theologian, and I don't want to indicate that church musicians aren't theologians, but what should be the relationship between the pastor and the cantor or choir director and organist, and perhaps in many of our Missouri Synod congregations, one person is all three of those. What should that relationship look like, building upon Luther's analogy of a handmaiden or help meet? Obviously, if you're going to give help, you've probably got to have communication and you've got to work together and you've got to be able to see the goal together and be looking in the same direction. I think all of those analogies are just fine for the relationship between a pastor and the main church musician. Uh, and <clears throat> you want it to be a harmony. Uh, for the musicians, we understand when notes are dissonant and how ugly that can be. And if there is a dissonance, well, I don't know, that sometimes is desirable in music too. Uh, theologians will know that we don't really buy into syncretism and unionism. We want to be clear on theology and we want to always, we don't want to mingle falsehood with truth. Uh, and, and both of those analogies are just fine for the relationship between the musician and the pastor as well. There's also kind of a practical thing. I'm almost hesitant to say it, but I think we should. And that is the reality that uh, your musician is most likely a very intelligent person. Music tends to be something that uh, increases your intelligence. Uh, think of, you know, baby Mozart and stuff. Uh, and... That means that doesn't have to be a fight in the same way that uh, for a husband to be the head of the household doesn't mean his wife becomes a dumb slave who's not supposed to think by no means. Uh, in fact, to have a wife who's, who's taking charge of her duties and who's actually doing something, who's valuable and useful in order to support her husband as a helpmeet, that's the whole point. And I think that is the relationship between a pastor and the church musician. I... I'd be hesitant to use this term, but it really ends up being the reality. Uh, the church musician is almost like the stage manager for the service. I can't imagine, I can't even count the number of times when I've seen church musicians uh, walking up to the pastor to get his ear and to, to ask a question or to confirm something. 
Uh, musicians are going to be the ones who are going to pester you. And I mean this in a good way uh, to get your hymns in or, or, or let's talk about hymns so we can plan them ahead so I can get to work, you know. Uh, and they're not going to want to do things last minute. But also if they have to come up and talk last minute, it's going to be serious and it's going to be and they have a wide view. Maybe that's just the uh, vantage point of the balcony that gives them that wide view. Uh, but it also shows up in the service. Look, pastors, we can be idiots. We can make mistakes. And uh, and when you make a mistake up in front of the church, everybody's going to know it. And the organist can either amplify that or they can subdue it and help you out. So if, if even if you're a wicked person, you ought to at least care about your reputation and get to know your musician so you can work together. But I, I think most of you listening are not wicked. So you can see the, the advantage and the, and the need for you to be uh, working with your musician so that, yeah, so that you're not embarrassing one another. Uh, because it, those kind of embarrassments are the biggest things that draw attention to ourselves. When I say that musicians are, are, are managing, that they're, they're planning, they have a high view of what's going on in the service, it doesn't mean that they're trying to manhandle the service. It doesn't mean that they're trying to take it over and make it about themselves or be a you know, performer uh, who's going to be the center of attention. Far from it. In fact, they know, maybe better than we do as theologians sometimes, that unpreparedness is almost always what leads us to improvise and to focus on ourselves rather than uh, what we're actually trying to do, which is be servants of the word of God. There's a way in which even we pastors are servants of God's word. We're not God himself. Uh, and the musician naturally knows that. That is the first advice that Peepcorn gives in his conduct of the service to pastors in being reverent, that in order to be reverent, one must be prepared. One must be prepared in what they've been called to do. So it makes perfect sense. In fact, when one is prepared, that is when the, the servanthood of what a pastor does or a musician does comes out most clearly because mistakes draw attention to, your, to you and away from the Word of God. And when you do what you've been called to do, you actually fall into the background and the Word of God has the forefront in everyone else's mind. Absolutely. I think you've said it perfectly. And when for us as pastors, if I can talk to the pastors for a second, we have to know that when our musician comes up to us and wants to talk, this is why. It, it's, it's to aid reverence. It's not to ruin it. Um, and uh, maybe in a sense, there, trust, this is so trite maybe, but trust is essential. And there's no way to build trust that I know other than long conversation, getting to know each other, getting to work. Uh, and everybody gets to do their part. The pastor, you're the teacher in the congregation. God's told you you have to do that. You get the right to teach and instruct and educate and and admonish and all these things to your musician. You're going to do it with the word of God and you're going to help train that person uh, to be a much stronger theologian. Uh, in the same way, the, the musician is going to see not only what they can help you with music, whether that's singing, but I don't, I think it's fair to say most musicians also have a much better understanding of reverence in the visual sense. Maybe that's an artistic thing. Maybe that's just a, a craftsmanship thing. But musicians are, they're in tune to this. And we can benefit from that so much. Look, you, we don't want to look like oafs up there. We don't want to look like these guys who, you know, came out with these big academic degrees, you know, but can't, uh, you know, can't work ourselves through the Lord's Prayer without sounding like a moron or Look, I don't know. I don't know how to say it. Your your musician does no more than you in some things in the same way that we most likely know more than they do theologically. And uh, and and the really dumb thing is is to not respect that mutually. That's how trust gets built. The other thing that's just f flat out necessary practically is that we all have thicker skin. This is our this is our world's trouble right now. I think we're all very thin skinned. We can't take criticism. I think as leaders, which pastors to some degree are, we can be hesitant to receive criticism. Your musician is going to know how to criticize you. Like I said, they'll know when you flub, and uh, and they'll know whether they can save you or whether or whether they need to leave you hanging. Right? 
Uh, but, right. but as a result, when they come up to you and say, Pastor, I noticed something, it's worth our time. You know, They're going to have to come up and say, Pastor, there's a mistake in the bulletin. You made it when you printed it, but here's what it is. Here's how we're going to fix it, or how would you like to fix it, Pastor? You know, there's no time for, for being... Uh, there's no time for being hurt or, or offended at that, right? Uh, that's the kind of relationship you need. Exactly. With all of this in mind, as the choir director slash organist, cantor, as a stage director, and that the pastor and the head of the music in the church, because I, I don't want to keep saying those three every single time, yeah. that that relationship is kind of a like a churchly marriage within the divine service how should that music be used kind of in grades like first and foremost it's going to be used in this manner and then secondly once we have this kind of first step down then how can the music be employed within the divine service. Does that question make sense? Maybe, or here, I'll just answer what I want to answer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, Lutheranism is different than other Christian groups. I, I, there are very few groups that have no music, and the ones that have no music have a theological reason for it. Uh, but Lutheran music has music as a feature, not as a side effect. Uh, and as a result, it's a particular kind of music with a particular ordering to it. And I have to say, many churches don't know that. Uh, when you go to a music catalog, just as pastors have probably started realizing, just finding a musician doesn't mean a whole lot. Because uh, you want to know what sort of musician are. What do they know? What are they going to play? What do they think is appropriate for church? In the same way, we need to know what our priorities are as Lutherans. And what most people think of as a church music is a church choir. And what are they going to do? They're going to get up maybe once a month if they're pretty ambitious. And they're going to learn a very uh, good song with Christian lyrics of some kind. And they're going to sing it in church. It's very similar to the way we usually treat Sunday school for that matter. You know, they learn a nice song and then we find a time when they can come sing it. And they do. And that's it. Uh, often these are called anthems, right? Uh, that, that's become the kind of the technical term. You're going to get up and we're going to sing an anthem, which is a fancy word that means a song, right? A piece that we learned. And uh, if, if, if you're lucky, it'll be a piece that kind of fits with the theme of the church here. You know, it's Easter right now when we're recording this, so maybe we're going to sing something about Jesus rising from the dead, our anthem. That'd be pretty good in a lot of churches. I think the Methodist church, that's essentially how they see the church choir. And a lot of our Lutheran churches have imitated that. That's a lot of the music that's readily available uh, from most publishing companies uh, are just one-off uh, individual anthems. Uh, they're relatively simple. Uh, they may be, I mean, they may be fine music. I'm not actually denigrating them. They may not be fine music too, uh, but there's something choirs can sing. But this is such a backwards way of thinking for a Lutheran musician. And uh, that's the hard part. In a sense, I don't know how to bridge the gap other than to explain the difference and to uh, help try and see how we can move towards a true Lutheran church music. I think pastors who've had a taste of this, maybe at seminary, maybe on their vicarage, uh, or at certain congregations that uh, have a rich Lutheran musical heritage. They understand this, uh, but, but others need to be taught uh, out of their ignorance, which uh, that's curable. We can handle that. Uh, for us, anthems are last. The song that the choir's chosen to sing uh, that's beautiful and that adds to the, to the worship experience, that is the absolute last thing. And in fact, if need be, we can live without it. But what is first is the service. And by that, I mean the liturgy. I mean the parts that we sing every Sunday. Uh, I mean the propers, which some congregations may not even use or may only speak. But those are actually the uh, primary songs for the choir in particular. And the other thing that has to be right up there is the hymns, which, yes, that's what the congregation sings, the organist leads, uh, but the choir 
is a handmaiden for the congregation to help them do their part better, to help them sing, uh, help them maybe get through a long hymn. Uh, and when that's all in place, that's where if you have all of that working, you may have a congregation with a very talented group of musicians that's able to consider something more, a motet, a, an anthem, a, a song that is in addition that would be able to be sung at various points in the service. Or I suppose if we're living in Leipzig, that's where we can consider something as grand as a cantata. But Bach is a unique guy and his congregation was, uh, you know, one of the pinnacles of Lutheran history. And, uh, to sing an anthem as the main part of the choir's work is like jumping into the cantata without having the sermon or the service or the rest of it first. Mm. So we should, in our mind's eye, primarily think of the choir as a liturgical leader yes. in the church's song. Yes. And there's a difference, I think, between a liturgical... I'm going to put it this way. I've heard it often said or noted in bulletins, the, a thank you to the choir. And, and well, how does that thank you go? Something like, we are so thankful uh, for our director and for our choir uh, for beautifying our service. I've even seen this in budget lines of churches. The organist's salary isn't called so-and-so's pay. It's called uh, beautifying the service or, or adding, right, embellishing, uh, making it beautiful. And I have no doubt, uh, trust me, I'm an organist. I love organ music. I think it does make the service beautiful. But if that's the attitude we have, we know it's an extra. It's like the flowers. It's like cleaning the carpet before Easter. It's, it's like tuning the piano. Well, I mean, how, what can we live without if the budget gets tight? Well, beautifying, I suppose. It's, it's not essential to the service. It's an extra. It's a tack on. And, you know, maybe it's a fantastic tack on. But if it is, it re again, uh, are we going to, uh, when we approach the task, are we going to make it about Christ? Or are we always going to have an ulterior motive to make it about ourselves? Especially if you've got to justify your own existence, which uh, sometimes just beautifying, adding, you know, a little embellishment and decoration to the service, that's expendable, right? Yeah, well, this gets back to what you said before, that in the Lutheran mind, Music is a feature, not an extra. That's right. Uh, and and the reason is the liturgy is a feature, not a, an extra. We don't consider that to be something that we just add on, you know, because I don't know, why not? We think it's essential. This is the way that, that uh, the word of Christ has been dwelling richly in the congregation for centuries, even in the Middle Ages, as confusing as it was, they had this as a feature, and Lutheranism only had to clean it up, not change it. Uh, and this really shows with music. If we have a true Lutheran choir that understands, again, what is the ordering? Number one, liturgy and hymns. Number two, the propers, the parts that the congregation isn't able to sing because it changes. That's that's difficult for people to sing uh, maybe a new melody and new words all in one day. you got to be a trained musician for that and maybe practice a little. And then distant third, and, and, and perhaps an extra that's not necessary in most cases, anthems, other songs that we chose to fit with the service. If we have this in order, we see that the primary duties of the choir are not add-ons. They're, they're part of the service, especially if it's singing the ordinary. If you don't have that, you don't have the church service. If, if we're not doing setting three or setting one, we're not doing any setting. We're not doing church. Uh, and if we're not singing the hymns, maybe there's no congregational participation at all, certainly not musically. Uh, the propers uh, become an essential. Who's going to do that if the choir doesn't do that? Do we really want to read it? Uh, and uh, no offense, one of my congregations, that's what we do. We don't have a choir. Uh, but my other congregation is blessed to have a choir, a choir who on some Sundays does nothing else. Uh, in fact, most of the Sundays, they do nothing else but sing the intro, sing the gradual, sing the Alleluia verse, and maybe sing one or two stanzas of the hymn of the day, especially if it's a long one, to help break it up for the congregation. And, uh, and here's the tough part for a lot of musicians to understand. This is not a weakness. This is not a choir that's doing a minimal thing. This is actually a choir that's at the top of their game. 
and doing exactly the right thing. So where does the mindset come from that it is a weakness? Well, even what I, what I, the way I put it uh, is so common to say all they're doing, they're only singing, uh, you know, the intro and they're only singing a hymn. I think there's a way in which we think, well, if it's in the book, if it's in the hymnal, or if it's in the Bible, that's not particularly exciting. But musicians are for performances, right? Now, our Lutheran listeners will say that performance is kind of a bad word to us. I think, look, that's the world that musicians live in. Don't be afraid of that term. But what we don't like is performance that draws attention to the performer. Uh, and trust me, I don't think your musician sees it that way either. If they play, an, if your organist plays an amazing prelude that they worked on, they're going to say, wasn't it great to hear this prelude? Isn't that such a beautiful piece? They didn't say, man, didn't I play that so great? That's not the way they think at all. They, they love they right. love the music. And, and yes, they were the one playing it, but they're just so glad to share that with you too. Uh, that's And that's the way a pastor thinks when he writes a sermon. You know, at the end, he's going to say, man, wasn't that a great text? <laughs> Anybody could have preached an amazing sermon on that because that's God's word. Trust me, your musicians, uh, if they're empowered to do this, if you actually... Um, expect this of them they're going to delight in doing that too they're going to say wow isn't that great today's quasimodo sunday and we got to sing as newborn infants crave the pure spiritual milk of the word hallelujah that's awesome uh and notice now they're not an extra they're not an add-on they're not a beautiful decoration and filigree that we could just as easily do without this is not a way to take the choir and minimize them. This is actually a way to draw, to, to make them essential. Yes, it, it won't emphasize their musical prowess, but I think that's the side of performance that is negative. What it will emphasize is the beautiful music. And for us as pastors, we care about the beautiful texts that they're singing. Mm. Even if it's a hymn prelude with no words at all, right? Is it going to be emphasizing and pointing us to the word of God and a great hymn that's now going to be stuck in my head? And I'm going to be humming it and saying, what is that? Oh, it's so sacred head now wounded. I wonder why we're hearing that on Christmas. Well, Bach did that for a reason in his cantata. And uh, yeah, so how do you do this? Yeah, I was just going to ask, uh, perhaps maybe go through kind of two situations. You get to a place where none of this is happening, or and then you get to a place where unwittingly the choir is seen as an add-on and therefore can be superfluous. Yeah. I'll be honest, it's always easier to start new. There's plenty of groups who've realized that. Most of us don't get that privilege and that easy path because we believe in the fourth commandment and we believe in a church that's more than just what I've created for myself. Uh, again, mm -hmm. that is also a feature, believe it or not. And if we have to bear with those who've come before us, pastors get used to this quick. We have to do that. And we have to see that as a feature and not as a, a detraction the church is older than us. That's really good. Uh, but the easiest situation for uh, getting a liturgical choir, a choir that's actually part of the service as opposed to decoration on your service, is to start it uh, from the beginning with that mindset, to teach them that the, we need somebody to help our congregation sing their parts. And a choir will help us do that. We need somebody to give the congregation a break so we can get through 10 stanzas of this amazing Luther hymn, uh, which was never intended to be sung by just uh, one group singing 10 stanzas in a row, but was always intended to be sung in tandem with other groups like this choir that's going to sing now. And we need somebody to sing this intro because if it's Quasimodo Sunday, we ought to know the Quasimodo thing. We ought to know that, like newborn infants, we are to crave the pure, pure spiritual milk of the word. Uh, and then, every once in a while, you get to do something really fun, like, let's learn a real fancy piece that fits with this text. Uh, and, and your choir will love that, and yet the thing that they'll love even more is the hymns, because those come back every year. Yeah. If you're at a church that uh, that has a choir that is used to singing anthems, your work will be harder. And the reason it'll be harder is 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 a lie that we've kind of been taught, which is that singing the Bible 
is not as interesting as singing a fancy piece. That's a real shame. I think everybody, when they hear it that way, should say, you're right, that's pretty backwards. When we're singing the propers, all we're doing is singing the Bible. When we're singing the parts of the liturgy, pretty much we're singing the Bible. And we're singing the hymns, we're singing the best poetry written about the Bible. And that's the heart of the service. Uh, but I would, I would teach this and, and talk, especially with your church musician first, and maybe even give a presentation to your choir and explain the difference. Tell them how just singing an anthem is beautiful, but it's decoration. And that uh, the choir is far more important, actually, in the Lutheran service than decoration. It becomes essential become, because, in a way, it becomes a, another preacher. It preaches in music the things that the pastor is saying. And it picks up the parts that the congregation can't be expected to sing afresh every week, uh, but they can do it. And they assist the congregation with the things they love. Well, that's excellent advice. What, if you're starting new to go back to that particular example give us like three or five steps that you should take with your church musicians to begin building that kind of mindset or even what can the pastor do kind of personally as someone who is serving in the service to foster that mindset sure uh, I am so privileged at Great Bend to have a beautiful choir of about five girls. They were a catechism class. I always make my catechism classes sing things. And uh, one day they sang something great. I told them I had to grab something. So you just, you guys just sing. I'll go up and grab it. I came back down and beautiful music was coming. And it was, it was the hymn I told them to sing. And I said, well, now you're in trouble because I heard you. You have great voices. And now we'll probably have to start a choir. And then I kind of forgot about it, actually. Uh, and they came and pestered me. So that, was, that ended up working out great. Okay, fine. We'll sing something. And uh, and we started from the beginning uh, doing the real thing. We we did the intro. That was the first thing we did. Uh, uh, we, we started singing the intro. And I sang part of it. And they joined in and sang the second half of each verse. Or, sorry, excuse me. We did a whole verse by whole verse. I sang the antiphon. They sang the verse. Uh, hymn stanzas are great because you can just learn stanza three of a four verse hymn, uh, have them sing stanza three, let the congregation bow out, and, uh, and then they can come back in on four. Uh, but from the beginning, we did that and we didn't do anything else. Uh, and they responded well to it. Uh, again, I think if they don't know any different, they won't have already bought into the falsehood that you got to be singing something fancy, for lack of a better word. Well, decorations ought to be fancy, uh, but we're doing uh, in what they're doing is the heavy lifting, far more important stuff than just being fancy. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're coming into a place that already has one, that's it's maybe more difficult, like I said. But but I think the especially if you're blessed to have a musician, the most important thing is. Your musician needs to have the altar book. Pastors, buy him or her a copy of the altar book if they don't have one. Don't uh, wait for them to grab it off the altar. As you know, it's monstrous, uh, but they need to have it. Why? Because that's their bread and butter. Uh, th those are the texts that, that you guys want to be singing. Those are the texts that are going to influence anything extra that you might pick from time to time. And, uh, like I said, the organist is naturally gifted, the musician and the organist are naturally gifted at reverence, at, at preparation, which aids reverence. And so they need to see the full rubrics. They need to know what you're doing and why. Uh, look, if that brings you some embarrassment because you don't know them, have some thick skin, man, uh, and, and grow up. Uh, what, what a wonderful thing it would be if your organist had to come and tell you, hey, aren't you supposed to do right? I mean, that's, that's beautiful. Now that person can be a help me to you, not a nag, but an assistant, a helper. Mm -hmm. uh, for the, or for the musician, this is going to be a little strange, right? Uh, but, but I think you know this already as a musician that discipline and limits don't hinder creativity. They actually aid it. Uh, you know, Bach didn't say, oh man, I got to write something on uh, the B minor mass. This is going to be a p worthless piece because it's, you know, gosh, how many people have written these words? Oh no. Every musician writes on famous texts like that. Every musician is not afraid to borrow from someone and it's not plagiarism. It's something they use to build and be even more creative. So this is your challenge, musician. You've got the altar book. 
you've got the list of hymns that you and maybe your pastor have, have worked together to select, or maybe he selected them for you. These are your starting points. And from there, I would really work with the organist to challenge them and the, and the music director, challenge them not to depart from it, maybe even for a full year. And get the choir on board. I, I think if you've already got a situation where you're uh, an occasional choir to sing a nice piece, an anthem, you gotta you gotta convince them. We're gonna do some different. We're we're gonna do this intentionally. We're gonna be deliberate about what we're doing to to sing uh, what what the church needs to be sung, and and to find pieces of music that fit with those propers. Maybe avoid all the alternate options that, of course, we have in our freedom, but uh, stick to them. And, and stick to the hymn of the day. And if you know nothing else, especially for the hymns, that's the easiest. you got the hymnal. Most of the hymns have four parts in them. If your choir is up to one or two or three or four, do it. Mm -hmm. Now, if you are a pastor who isn't particularly musically inclined, how do you engage in speaking with the musician on what you would like to see happen? You engage. Uh, there's no <laughs> shortcut. You, there's no shortcut for conversation in hardly anything in this world. Um, yeah. And face-to-face uh, -face will help. If, if you're new to a congregation or if you've never taken the time, uh, buy, your, buy your musician dinner and then say, can we go into the balcony and, uh, and look through the hymnal together? You can play the tunes I don't know. And uh, let's figure out which hymns we know as a congregation, which ones we don't. So we have a starting place. Uh, and from there, you can start talking about it, right? I, I think, especially in a place where the organist or the musician is, is willing to work with the pastor like this, I think a regular think tank session is necessary. Uh, it doesn't have to be, and this is a different way of thinking. Uh, the organist, you have to work with what they have. Maybe they just view themselves as an accompanist. But if you have an organist and choir director, then I think as soon as there's a choir involved, you definitely need to meet together because you're going to have words to deal with. Uh, if you want to think of this as a worship committee, which I think is a, f a fearful word for a pastor, uh, <laughs> you don't have to think of it like that. Uh, but but now it's not. But but when you invite them in to talk, you are actually giving them their space. Uh, the, there is a way in which a, a musician, again, like a wife to a husband in a godly marriage, there is a submission of the musician to the pastor that is godly and by no means stifles the musician's creativity. But again, these limits aid their creativity. It allows them to be entirely free in the area where they are. And I think that's, that's far better than what happens in a lot of churches, which is approval. And I know musicians hate this. I got to turn in my music to the pastor and see if it's okay, right? The whole idea sounds degrading, uh, but there's no substitute for this. You've got to teach them how to think theologically. You've got to help uh, help have them think through it. And again, most musicians are very intelligent. They're very capable for the, of this, and I think I think they'll go with you. What is their limit? You know, let their limit be the lectionary. Don't let it be the book. We pastors do this all the time, right? We don't want to have to argue with people at funerals. So we tell them if it's in LSB or TLH or whatever our book happens to be, we'll sing it. And if it's not in that book, we won't sing it. Uh, look, I understand being under duress and sometimes you just gotta, you gotta do what you gotta do. But I think in the long run, that practice will hurt you because it won't teach them anything. They won't be discerning at all. And hate to say it, just because it's in the book, doesn't mean it's really great. Right. Uh, I, I hope our listenership agrees with that, but just because it's in the book doesn't mean it's really great. And if you want to have a good enough church, go for it. You know, you could do anything then. But if you want to actually improve, if you want to be singing the best, especially if you're a pastor who thinks through what you're doing, if you want one sermon to connect to another, if you want to actually prepare these people to die as Christians, you want to give them some arm armament against the devil in their death, well, you're going to have to think about what you're singing. You're going to have to care about that. And you also want your organist to be thinking that way and your musician. So, uh, you know, let the lectionary be your limit. Uh, if you are not using the historic lectionary, uh, which I think a lot of our listeners are, your musician will help you. Uh, I think your musician will respond really well to it. 
when you use the three-year lectionary, we've got a totally new set of propers that uh, some our, our CPH publishing is coming out with some music for, and, and actually a lot of it's okay. It's pretty good, uh, but uh, you're you're very limited because and you have no help in your creativity because you have nothing to draw on. Whereas, just like we know for our sermons, we can draw on the fathers, on Luther, on Walther. Uh, in the same way, the musician has Bach and they have Praetorius. Uh, Shine has some very manageable things for a small congregation, not to mention simple Gregorian chant. Uh, so so that helps. Uh, and I think your musicians will be even stronger advocates for the historic lectionary than, than we pastors are. And you know how bullish we get on things like that. So, <laughs> What I found helpful in my relationship here with my organist and choir director, who is all the same, you know, lovely woman. She and I get along very well together. She jokes around with me, but she can be very serious about music. And yet she's always wanting to learn theologically about the texts. And that willingness of her to want to learn about those things really does open me up to wanting to learn about perhaps having a wider array of actual musical settings. For example, changing this tune of this hymn because it's more familiar to the congregation, but this text does fit here. And her knowledge of that, even though I might be usually kind of stodgy about that, because of her knowledge in that and her willingness to always listen to my kind of theological rationale for the text oftentimes softens me to, you know, making some of those changes because most of the people in our pews aren't reading music, right? They're, they're going by what the organist plays. There are obviously some tunes that I'm not willing to do that for, but, you know, on the whole, you know, if it's an unfamiliar tune, uh, I, I might be more willing to do that because she's so willing to listen to me. At the same time, I think since a pastor can be willing to take instruction from the organist musically, that opens the musician up to taking instruction theologically. And so I think that two-way street there can be very helpful in building that relationship so that the Word of God has puts its stamp on the service and not each other's personalities. That's right. We can do that just by saying yes or no, I suppose. We can do that by saying, well, if it's in the book, it's not horrible. But I think that's a pretty shoddy way to plan your services. I think that's a pretty shoddy way to, to um, that's not excellence, you know. Well, it's it's not bad. We c That's not, doesn't mean it's necessarily good. Uh, and when you give your organist these tools, it actually opens up their work. Um, and for those who are even creative enough to do co composition, which is incredible, now you, you start to discover there's really not anything good on this. Uh, and all of a sudden, well, maybe I should try my hand at writing this, right? Yeah. So it opens it up for the future too. Uh, it, it, look, in the, in the meantime, in a congregation that has, you know, the anthem choir, uh, you're going to have to make some compromises too, I think, as a pastor. But if you if you open the door, if you're able to talk together, now suddenly we can at least work with those things uh, to, to take the next step in the right direction. Now, instead of singing this anthem, which is not very good, uh, and just, you know, because we learned it, uh, now we can put that where it belongs. You know, maybe it really doesn't belong in church at all, but... Uh, uh, it does happen to be about the resurrection and it's Easter season. So we'll sing it here as opposed to there. Uh, and, and that can go a long way to helping them understand uh, how to think in terms of the church year. But uh, gi giving them the altar book is incredible. Now they know what you're doing. Now it's not a mystery. And again, I think they're intelligent. And if they, if they take a peek through it, that is a source of inspiration. I don't know. It has been for centuries. The introits and all of the all of these texts have been the inspiration for the greatest music ever made on the planet. Uh, so, so that's our bailiwick. That's we love that. I would put a couple of plugs in here. One for the organist workshops at the Fort Wayne Seminary in the summertime. My organist has gone to a couple of them and has just 
thrived under the instruction of what the liturgy is all about and what is possible, like what you're talking about, Sean, with regard to choirs and things, and what their focus, their primary understanding of themselves should be. I think that has served very helpfully. And sometimes, you know, having them hear it from someone else besides the pastor can, can be helpful. Not that a pastor can't do that himself, and he should be, and those types of workshops are kind of secondary. They can also be helpful. The other side, uh, the other plug that I want to put in is maybe going together to something like the Good Shepherd Institute and being able to talk about what is being discussed there with regard to music, because you have access to some of the foremost theologians and church musicians who come together and discuss those very things. Those, uh, particularly the Good Shepherd Institute I went to when I was an organist serving for my pastor, Pastor Rippey. Uh, it was his idea. I went along with it. And uh, boy, that's where I discovered Luther's hymns and Gerhard's hymns. Uh, and uh, he started preaching on the one-year lectionary using Luther as a guide. I started uh, looking at all the historic music that was uh, available to me. And uh, it was a incredible relationship and, and probably no small part of the reason why I went on to, to go into the ministry myself. So uh, a couple uh, practical things, especially if your congregation already has kind of an anthem choir, I'm going to put it that way. Um, musicians, take a look at uh, hymn concertados. These are kind of, uh, you know, variations. You might call them on a hymn with some organ, maybe with orchestra if you have those available to you, or even just simply with the choir arrangements. You know, they have the they have the feel of an anthem, if I can call it that. They come in a nice octavo form, uh, so they'll look familiar to your choir. Uh, and frankly, CPH is putting out some pretty good stuff right now on a lot of hymns. Uh, make the hymns an important part. Again, the challenge of this isn't that your choir needs to be doing more music or harder music. Actually, the simplest thing you could possibly do is to sing the hymn stanzas a cappella, which is what my choir does in unison, and uh, have them chant uh, the intro and the gradual using some simple tone. Uh, the LSB tones that are right in the hymnal are very simple. If you could do that every Sunday or every Sunday that your choir is available to sing, you would be now an indispensable part of the service. The tough part is we tricked ourselves into thinking that the harder music, the anthems, that takes a little more work, is the more important thing. And actually, it's not. Uh, and if you want to swing for the fences and sing amazingly detailed settings of the intro and gradual and the hymns, those are available to you also. Uh, another thing is, uh, my organist friend told me this, uh, uh, the choir will begin to love the hymns more than anything. I, I'm confident of it. Our hymns are amazing, especially if your uh, choir director is able to take any time, or maybe even the pastor comes in and explains the richness of this hymn or the story behind it. That is an incredible way to get people to love hymns. Your choir is going to help introduce new hymns to the congregation and make them hymns that your congregation loves. And uh, once there's a choir, that's sometimes how you get new members. They get tired of the choir always stealing their stanzas. You tell them, well, if you join the choir, you can sing stanza three also. Okay, fine, I will, right? And of course, it's because they love the hymns, <laughs> not because they hate it. Uh, and for the for the psalms, there are there are lots of options. Uh, simple is better, uh, in my opinion. Sometimes also having a choir sing multiple styles, whether that's the LSB chants that are in the book, or the traditional Gregorian ones, or uh, Gillino psalms, some other things like these. They'll, they'll start to see, oh, there's a, actually quite a bit of variety uh, for how to use these texts. But, but the most important thing is to see, again, that it is the texts of the church. It is the lectionary. It is all of these propers that go with those readings that you, the pastor, are preaching on. Uh, that is the source of the music. That this word of Christ would be dwelling richly in us. And the musicians don't just get to decorate the word of Christ. The musicians are making that word dwell richly in the whole congregation. That's why once you, here's the funny side effect. Once you start having a liturgical choir, like we're describing Pastor Broughton, pretty soon you stop being a choir that, that sings once a month and sings, you know, something pretty. And you start realizing 
maybe we need to sing every week. Uh, the liturgical choir becomes so important, so essential, because they're actually part of what the whole service is, not just a fancy, cute add-on, that uh, pretty soon it's uh, hard to get by with just having them sing every once in a while. I was surprised that my high school girls with softball and everything else refused uh, to, to quit choir when I wanted to take some breaks. And uh, they said, we have to sing the St. John Passion again this year. I said, I don't think we have time to learn it. And they said, we're going to try anyway. We're going to do it. And they did. Who am I to argue with that? Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, I think on that note, we've covered the ground that we set out to cover and Unless you have something to add. Just a quick summary again. The most important thing is the ordinary of the liturgy, their main canticles. If your congregation struggles, your choir starts there. Hymns. Teaching new hymns is always hard because we like what we already know. Well, your choir is the way you introduce that. And then if you have long hymns, uh, that's a perfect place to make use of the choir so we don't lose the story by chopping off half of it. But look, it, it's a breathing sport, singing. So you got to give people a break to breathe. Uh, the next most important thing in the way the choir becomes essential is to sing the propers, the introit, the gradual, the alleluia verse, that these aren't just uh, things for responsive reading, but they're, they're the choir's job. It's hard to sing new melodies. It's also really hard to sing new words that change every week, but that's where the choir gets to do with the congregation and the untrained singers can't. Then once all of those things are in place, which I think you'll have plenty of work doing, uh, there's where more, uh, occasional things uh, will arise of their own and motets and anthems uh, but again they'll come out of the texts that are being preached on that day and uh, and they won't be just decorative and uh, add-ons that we could easily do away with but they will also become uh, essential parts of the whole service excellent well thank you very much for your time sean and for walking us through all of these things I look forward to hearing perhaps your choir sing the St. John Passion sometime. That'd be fun. So thanks again, and you take care, and happy Easter to you. You too. <laughs>